So if we look at hepatitis B, it is a DNA virus. It's interesting to note as well that it's 100 times more infectious than HIV. It can survive seven days outside of the body, and its structure assists us a lot in the analysis of um, the disease itself. So you have your viral DNA that we can assess its levels. Depending on the levels of the viral DNA, um, it can tell us which chronic phase the patient is actually falling into. Your surface antigen is a marker of infection that is currently acute, especially if the surface antigen positivity is less than six months. When the patient goes into a more than six months phase, they are moving towards the, the chronic phase, and we start to also look at hepatitis E antigen. Your hepatitis core antigen is largely telling us that there is acute and active infection. Your hepatitis E, along with the viral load, also tells us that there is an actively replicating hepatitis B virus. The mode of transmission, vertically, mother to child transmission, this is the highest population likely to move from acute to chronic at about 90%, okay? So that is why there's the introduction of the birth dose. Your child then, who is less than five, has about a 33% chance of progressing to chronic, whereas adults have about a 5% chance. So it is actually our babies that we are very concerned about as well. Horizontal transmission via blood, saliva, and vaginal secretions, and menstrual blood or semen. Parenteral transmission is through, obviously, your IV drug users, those who are um, having tattoos, as well as surgical instruments. So when it comes to surgical instruments, if you are an HIV, I mean, if you are hepatitis uh, positive, clinician, then you would also need to uh, be initiated on therapy so that you do not transmit it to your, um, your, 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 your patient, okay? Sexual transmission, there's a higher risk in, in, uh, in if there's vaginal or inner lining uh, um, damage and if the patient has co-infection with an STI. We've said that the seroprevalence is 7% at this stage of your surface antigen positive in the general population. Around 3.4 million people are affected. In key populations, 4% of those would be sex workers. 3% is found amongst men who have sex with men. And then 5% um, of your intravenous drug users. Up to 60% of patients would be HIV and hepatitis B co-infected, and there's an impact that that would have on the disease progression. So your patient can come in acutely hepatitis B infected. Less than 0.5% of them would then develop some necrotic features in their liver and would be termed those having fulminant hepatic failure. Out of the acute, about 90% of your neonates would progress to chronic hepatitis B infection. 33% childhood infections would progress and then less than 5% of your adult infected patients would progress to chronic hepatitis. Now, the path from here is that 33% of them can immediately move to your fatal progressive liver failure. Others would develop cirrhosis, liver scarring, and 20% per year of these would have your decompensated cirrhosis, where they start to show signs and symptoms of all the cycles happening in the liver being disarranged. Cirrhosis can then lead directly to hepatocellular carcinoma, and the carcinoma, less than 5% per year, could actually die. Are we together? You're awfully quiet. Are we good? Are we all on the same page? Are you scared? <laughs> Be not afraid, colleagues. This is why we have said it's preventable. I think that's the other key message, all right? 
Okay. So prevention then, mother to child, uh, prevention of hepatitis B, maternal surface antigen screening becomes important. Tenofovir in the third trimester of pregnancy for hepatitis B viral DNA of more than 200,000 international units. Remember that monotherapy is for your HIV negative, but your uh, HIV positive patients, you would have to make sure there's at least two of your nucleotide agents in the regimen. Are we together? Okay, that's why we saw in the adult guidelines, there's obviously the screening that has to happen when you are moving a patient out of tenofovir, so you make a decision whether you can drop it or not. Birth dose of hepatitis um, vaccine within 24 hours of delivery, and we have explained why. It's because there's that 90% that can progress to chronic hepatitis. And in your high-risk patient, you may even need to give your hepatitis B immunoglobulin. Universal hepatitis B viral vaccinations as part of EPI continue, and that birth dose is, is, is part of the addition. Prevention with adult transmission then, vaccination of your high-risk groups, which is inclusive of your healthcare worker, your HIV-positive patients, your um, your, your, those who are using intravenous drugs, as well as contacts of your hepatitis surface antigen positive patient, uh, people. All the details of this would obviously be in the, long, the, the training that you'll receive. Treatment of hepatitis B viral infected individuals is using your nucleotide analogs. And then access to sterile injecting equipment is important as part of the program, as well as your opioid uh, substitution therapy, promoting condom use and lubricants to, to actually protect that uh, vaginal lining to decrease transmission risk. What diagnostic test do we do? As we manage a patient at primary level, you would take your ALT or the AST. The ALT is obviously important in assessing the degree of the, hepat the hepatitis. AST is also important, um, especially when we move on to assessing the risk of cirrhosis. There is a, uh, uh, an equation that we will use to assess the risk of cirrhosis in our chronic patients. Full blood count and INR, remember that the clotting profile would change, and this tells you the prognosis of in this patient. Hepatitis B serology would be analyzing your surface antigen, analyzing your anti-hepatitis surface antigen antibodies, your hepatitis E antigen, and your hepatitis E antibodies. Okay. Hepatitis B viral DNA selects which patients are in which phase of the chronic disease. The non-invasive test called APRI is really the equation I was talking about here to assess the risk of cirrhosis in the patient. Here we would take the upper limit of normal when it comes to your AST. That would be divided by the patient's AST, and then we further divide it by the platelet count, multiply it by 100. And if it is above three, it tells us that this patient has a high risk of cirrhosis. But don't worry too much, this will <laughs> come in the training. Then um, alpha fetoprotein is obviously to look at those that have now progressed to liver cancer. Hepatitis B viral treatment and referral is indicated for your hepatitis E antigen positive patients confirmed to be chronic hepatitis patients in the immune clearance phase, your hepatitis E antigen negative chronic patient who are called immune escape patients. You have to refer to a physician or a hepatologist Hepatitis C, HIV co-infected patients need to be referred. Patients on dialysis or transplantation 
or they are a transplant candidate and are hepatitis positive. Patients on immunosuppressant therapy, chemotherapy, and other additional factors would be your family history of hepatocellular carcinoma or cirrhosis or previous treatment history as well as presence of your extrahepatic manifestations. manifestations. If treatment is not indicated, we have to continue to <coughs> monitor the patient because that status can actually change at any stage. Your hepatitis B treatment at primary level involves use of tenofovir, and it can be used as a monotherapy, like we said, in your HIV negative. It is a nucleotide analog, and it's potent, has a high genetic barrier for resistance, and the aim of the treatment is to suppress the hepatitis virus. That's why if you take it off, it can flare up, and it's more dangerous than the patient will die quicker from that than HIV itself, if they are HIV positive. Once started on treatment, this is an indefinite treatment that the patient will be on, okay? The monitoring would be your HIV screening for those who are HIV negative. Creatinine is also monitored because of the side effects of tenofovir. If there's a renal risk, you have to include a bone density scan as well, and during therapy, you can then monitor the lactic acid if you have any clinical concern. For healthcare workers who are hepatitis B positive, these patients would have, with the serum of, hepat of, of more than a, a viral DNA of more than 200, conducting exposure prone procedures for their patients would need to have a nucleotide analog therapy. This is so that we reduce the transmission to the patient. Um, the alternatives we have are just the tenofovir. There's also TAF, which is a precursor, preferred um, because the renal and the bone density risks are less with TAF. The aim is to decrease the viral DNA in this uh, patient who is also a healthcare worker to undetectable levels or at least to levels of less than 200 before they can resume their work of, being, uh, of, of working in ex, uh, ex, um, procedures that expose the patient. If it's a practicing surgeon, they need to be monitored for compliance and efficacy where it's required. As, well, as far as pregnancy and breastfeeding, pregnant women should be treated per the recommend, recommendation of your non-pregnant women. Your surface antigen pregnant women with a DNA level of 200,000 international units need to commence uh, antiviral therapy. But if they're already on antiretrovirals with tenofovir, that's um, a different case. Infants born to hepatitis uh, surface antigen positive women should receive the birth dose of hepatitis B viral vaccination with or without the immunoglobulin, and breastfeeding is not contraindicated for those receiving um, TDF. When we look at a hepatitis B viral positive and HIV co-infected patient, the co-infection, what it does is that it increases the likelihood of a patient who's got acute hepatitis going into a chronic phase, right? The, the, H, the, the, the HIV replication is faster, I mean the hepatitis B viral replication is faster and the patient can progress to fibrosis and cirrhosis more likely if they're HIV positive as well. The hepatocellular carcinoma risk is also increased and the risk of ART hepatotoxicity as well as iris is also increased in this patient. And perinatal hepatitis B viral transmission is obviously increased as well. Your hepatitis HIV co-infected patient, we have to manage by making sure we screen for hepatitis using the surface antigen and anti, uh, uh, um, hepatitis B surface and antibodies. If they are non-immune, they are a, uh, 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 vaccinated with the three doses we spoke about, zero, one, and six. We need to offer hepatitis A vaccination, especially to your MSMs, and then screen them for hepatitis C as well. 
All patients who are Hep B and HIV co-infected need to have a nucleotide um, <coughs> regimen in place with two agents being able to be active against the hepatitis B. The post-exposure prophylaxis for those who are potentially exposed to needle stick or sexual exposure, wounds need to be washed with soap and water, mucous membrane must be flushed with water, and the exposed individuals must be screened and um, the source individual as well needs to be screened and source and exposed individuals must be classified as either infected, immune or non-immune. That ends hepatitis B. Any questions? <laughs>